Hi, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Um, welcome to another C2C Care webinar. This one is all about tools used for emergency planning. To start off with, I would like to acknowledge that this webinar is being moderated on the traditional lands of the Miccosukee and Seminole people and their ancestors, and I pay my respect to elders, both past and present. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share just a few slides, and then we are going to go ahead and get started today. So bear with me while I pull that up. As I said, today we are here for tools for emergency planning. It's part of our May Day prep series. You're going to see me um, introduce one of my colleagues in a few minutes to talk a little bit more about that. But before we start, I did want to go through some basics with our C2C care program in case you are new to us. Again, my name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C care coordinator, and you just saw, heard Mike Marno. He's our senior producer at Learning Times. Um, if you have any questions throughout the entire program, feel free to throw them in the chat. We will get to them as quickly as it can when it comes to technical aspects. If you haven't already, I encourage you to go to our website, connectingtocollectionscare.org. Um, on that website, you will find all sorts of fun resources when it comes to our program, including our entire archives of webinars, uh, a course archive, our link to our community, our moderated community, which is moderated by a fabulous group of people who answer questions related to collections care and also curated resources. So a lot of the resources that we talk about later today are already linked on our website, but if you have one and you're interested in sharing it, I encourage you to email it and send it to us. We also have two places that we appear on social media, um, at C2C Care on Twitter and on Facebook. So we put announcements of updated courses and programs and all sorts of fun stuff on there. So I encourage you to follow us if you're on either one of those platforms. As Mike said, we have two ways that you can communicate with our panelists and our speakers today. One is the chat box, which everyone's usually very good at and will tell us all about the weather or what's going on. We're also going to ask at some point for you guys to communicate with our panelists in the chat box, so keep that up throughout the program. We also have a Q&A box. The Q&A box is there for questions for our panelists. So if you have a question at any point during the program, I encourage you to put it in that Q&A box. It allows us to keep track of the questions as we go along. And just a quick programming note, we have an upcoming webinar at the end of the month, also part of this May Day program. It's called Sustainability as Disaster Preparation. Um, at the end of the month on May 31st, we'll be talking to a couple different people on examples on how they have adopted sustainability practices when it comes to disaster planning, um, which can, as we all, if you've experienced a disaster, you know how much uh, sometimes looking at it, there's a lot of stuff that's produced from it. So we're hoping that so learning about these sustainability practices will help us when it comes to planning and working through disasters. So as we said, this is part of FAIC's May Day and May Day prep um, program. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce my colleague, Elena Gregg. She's the emergency coordinator for AIC to talk a little bit about May Day and some of the stuff we have going on about that. So Elena, feel free to take over whenever you're ready. Thank you, Robin. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, as Robin mentioned, today's webinar is part of FAIC's May Day programming. Um, and each year we encourage cultural organizations to do one thing during the month of May to enhance their disaster preparedness. Um, activities could include reviewing your emergency plan, taking steps to write an initial emergency plan, um, training staff on emergency preparedness, or practicing your institution's phone tree or means of communicating with staff. Um, and we actually have a whole list of ideas for activities on our website. Um, but if you have completed an activity or plan to complete one this month, um, I'm going to put in the chat a link to a survey that you can fill out and uh, entry into the survey will secure you a place in a drawing and we're going to give away several FAIC emergency resources and a registration to a Connecting to Collections Care course. Um, so I'll do that momentarily. Um, but I'd also just like to mention that we are in the process of um, making the emergency response and salvage app available again. Um, so that will be an additional tool in our collective toolbox. Um, and the app is based on the emergency response and salvage wheel um, and will be free to download and use. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled for announcements about the app later this summer. Um, otherwise, I'm going to hand it back over to Robin and proceed with today's program. Thanks, Elena, perfect. Um, we do encourage you to enter into that drawing because we're always excited to see who's participating, what they're doing for emergency prep and um, fun stuff to give away. We always like to give away free stuff, so please do so if you can. 
So we're going to go ahead and get started with today's program. Our first presenters are Sonia Barron. She's a conservator at National Archives and Record Administration and Kim Hoffman, preservation librarian at Miami University. They're going to be talking a little bit about the AIC emergency wiki and some of the fun progress they've made over that for a little bit. So if you guys will all bear with me, we'll start that presentation in a second and then we will go on with our program. So thanks and we will see you soon. Hello, my name is Sonia. Kim and I are members of the AIC Emergency Committee. This past year, we have been working on updating the Emergency Preparedness and Response Wiki page, hosted by AIC. We're going to take you through a short presentation to explain what the wiki is all about and how to use it. Collections emergencies happen often. They can be big or small, and they never happen at a good time. Getting prepared for an eventual emergency and having some sort of a plan is incredibly important. Collections emergencies are stressful, overwhelming, and chaotic. Everyone feels out of control. And having a plan and a team of people who are able to follow the plan can really help. Emergencies come in many shapes and sizes. It could be something local, like spring thaw flooding, a water leak from the pipes, an overflowing dehumidifier, or it could be something large and catastrophic, like a hurricane, an earthquake, or a fire. Whatever it is, having a step-by-step -step course of action to follow can be your best asset. Smaller institutions do not have a lot of resources and have very few staff and volunteers to take on the work of emergency preparedness. Another problem is knowing where to go to find trusted information. There are so many resources out there and they're often scattered across multiple websites. We would like to help with that. We want to share with you a resource hub that is free to access. It contains trusted, vetted, and current information on all aspects of emergency preparedness and response. In this presentation, we'll share with you how this resource hub came to be. Top professionals in the fields of collections care, and industrial hygiene took a whole year to compile the resources and then another nine months to review and vet the information. At this point, we're ready to go public. We wanna get the word out. These resources are both in depth and broad and they have been curated and made available for you to use. It is all accessible from one web page, the AIC Wiki on Emergency Preparedness and Response. After I go over the history of the project, my colleague Kim will demonstrate for you how to navigate the wiki and how to browse the online library. This project was started by the working group called REACH, R-E-A-C-H. <clears throat> it stands for Resources for Emergencies Affecting Cultural Heritage. The kickoff meeting for the project happened in January of 2020, just before the start of the pandemic. The initial goal of the working group was to bring in all disciplines within the Smithsonian Institution to the table to work on emergency response. One of their motivations was that the emergency management is a priority of good collection stewardship. And yet few museum studies programs include a comprehensive overview of emergency preparedness and disaster response. The official goals of the project were, goal one, gather resources for people who respond to collections emergencies and in cultural institutions. Organize the information on a centralized digital platform that is free to use. Goal two, vet and verify all resources, provide example of current practices for cultural heritage emergencies. Goal three, provide tools for small and mid-sized institutions to answer the question of what are the levels of our emergency preparedness at this time? 
offer guidance on next steps to take to reach preparedness goals. Many REACH working group members are from different units within the Smithsonian Institution. Others join from outside institutions and organizations. All in all, 29 very busy people participated. These logos represent just a few of the workplaces that the group members hail from. The Library of Congress, FEMA, the Conservation Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania State Archives, the National Park Service, New York Public Library, AIC and FAIC, the National Archives, NEH, Association of Registrars and Collection Specialists, American Industrial Hygienists Association, and more. Early on, one member of the group said that such a project can only be accomplished through micro-volunteerism. A lot of people doing just a little bit of work each equals bringing to fruition a big project, making a big contribution and a strong impact. Just imagining what all these people know collectively sends shivers down my spine. All the resources that they use and that they're aware of pulled together is a phenomenal body of knowledge. So how was this body of knowledge organized? The structure of the resource library is based around a disaster cycle with some key subject areas highlighted. Health and safety, planning, preparedness, mitigation, response, salvage, and recovery. Each of these headings can be seen as a bucket with links. Some have subcategories. You can think of those as smaller buckets. My colleague Kim from the AIC Emergency Committee will walk you through it when she does her demo for, for the actual tool. It is important to note that this tool is more suitable for proactive planning efforts. It's not as helpful for those in the midst of an emergency. You might ask, what is this actual tool that we'll learn um, to use today? Well, taking the words directly from their website, I will tell you that Zotero is a free, easy to use tool to help you collect, organize, cite, and share research. Some of you may have heard of Zotero before. I had never used it before working on this particular project. I'd, I'd heard about it and a colleague had offered to show me how it works, but I kept delaying. I had a sense that it would be overwhelming, confusing, and just another techie thing I had to learn on top of numerous other techie things. But honestly, I found out that there was little cause for concern. I learned how to use Zotero very quickly and did not experience technology frustration. The Zotero program also offers an opportunity to add some context. Uh, where exactly did the information come from? How old is it? What is the citation? This particular library for emergency preparedness and response is open to the public. So you do not have to create a Zotero account in order to read the content. The way that the library appears on your computer screen is very similar to the way that files appear on a PC or a Mac, like in my documents or desktop or in a network drive. The REACH group divided into a few smaller groups, taking on different roles in the process of gathering and vetting the information. The advisory group recommended what to include in the Zotero library. Researching, selecting, and organizing resources into categories took about a year. Once the information was added to the Zotero library, the review teams took over. The review process took about nine months. Each team of three or four people was assigned a list of resources from a category or a subcategory. Each team member used a pre-established rubric to rate the resources on their list. The rubric took into account several factors. How applicable is the content to this specific category? How reliable and well-regarded in the professional field is the source that published the content? Is this content up-to-date? Are these practices current? How accessible is the content? Do you have to pay? 
Each rubric aspect was assigned a point value from one to four, with one being the lowest and four being the highest. After everyone was finished rating, team members compared notes and came to a consensus. The final ratings were forwarded back to the advisory group to make any necessary changes. Only resources with a sum total of 10 points or higher were retained in the library and the rest were weeded out. In retrospect, having to work from home during the pandemic probably helped to get this project done. All communication and meetings were accomplished electronically and virtually. So the REACH Working Group created a one-stop shop for reliable, relevant, and applicable materials. To make access free and easy, the Zotero Library had to be integrated into the AIC Emergency Committee Wiki page. It is true that most people working in smaller institutions do not know what the AIC Wiki is and how to use it. But luckily, many people do know about connecting to Collection Scare and the free webinars that this excellent program brings to the preservation community. We are so happy to be able to share the Wiki page for emergency preparedness and response with you through this webinar. Please tell your colleagues and friends about this new tool. AIC's Emergency Committee is responsible for managing the Wiki page. As a bit of um, aside information, this committee is involved in many activities that focus on the topics we discussed. Um, in addition to the Wiki page, committee members work on writing articles and social media posts, organizing webinars and workshops, supporting the work of nat uh, national heritage responders, and collaborating with other collections-based organizations and institutions. As time goes on, some links will inevitably need to be updated. Emergency committee members are responsible for updating the Wiki page and the Zotero library as it is needed. There is a place on the Wiki page where users can submit suggestions to the committee via email. In the email, a user can submit suggestions to the committee Suggested new resources will go through a similar review as the one used for the original Zotero library. And now, without further ado, Kim is going to show you how the wiki works. Here comes the wiki demo. Vroom, vroom. Later. Thank you, Sonia. Now I'd like to take you through a demonstration of our wiki page and our Zotero library. So I'll begin here on the AIC Wiki main page. I'll use the search bar to search for emergency preparedness and response. And that brings us to our page here. You can see at the top, there is a table of contents, which lets you navigate directly to the sections that interest you if you'd like. This format may be familiar to you if you're accustomed to using the AIC Wiki. As we scroll down, you can see the introduction. There's more context here about the history of this page and how it was developed, if you'd like to look into that. Information about the AIC Emergency Committee and about the REACH group that Sonia discussed earlier in the presentation. So if you keep scrolling, the resource library in Zotero section begins the portions of the page that take you directly to our Zotero resources. And there's some instructions and tips here for using Zotero if you need a refresher. So here are the AIC Emergency Committee Library. All of these links um, with this icon, link to an external resource, and we'll note where they link to Zotero here. All inclusive resources takes you to the top level, and the rest of these sections are subcategories of our library. 
And if we keep scrolling down, at the bottom of the page, there's information on how you can contribute suggestions, comments, or questions by contacting us at this email address. And finally, these are the contributors who were members of that REACH group and who worked on compiling this library. So let's scroll back up and we'll click on the All Inclusive Resources link. And that opens the web version of our Zotero library. There's also a desktop version if that's something that you'd like to download and configure, but the web version is the default here. Note that you do not need an account to look at this library. If you would like an account or you already have an account, there is an option for logging in, but that's not required. So you can see here on the left hand side is the navigation. And that mirrors the navigation setup that we had in our wiki page. So you can see that it's broken out into these subcategories here. When I click on a folder on the left hand side, this view in the middle shows the resources that are in that folder. And I can expand those folders to look at subfolders. So let's click back to health and safety. You can see that there's quite a lot of resources in this folder. Below this library table of contents, we have a tag cloud. And so what this is showing is all of the tags associated with resources in this folder. So I'll click on the COVID-19 tag and that shows all of the resources that have that COVID-19 tag. In this case, there's only one. And the view now shows all of the tags associated with that one resource. So when I click the item, this right-hand side shows the item view with more information. It shows me that this item type is a document. There are lots of different types of items that Zotero can show. We have books, we have web pages, we have reports, uh, and the sub information shown here will vary depending on the item type. We also have the title, the contributor, the date, the URL where you can access it, and other metadata kinds of information. I particularly want to direct you to this notes tab because this is where the reach group has added useful commentary about each item. So this can be really helpful, especially for items that you don't have immediate access to, such as bibliography entries about books, for understanding what is in that content without having to go through it all yourself. So in the next tab, we have those tags again. This is the same as the tags over here on the left. And then we have the attachments pane. So there oftentimes won't be anything here. And finally, related. So there's nothing in this view for this particular resource, but this is where we would add information about relationships between this item and other items in the library. So for example, a parent and child relationship, such as a book and a chapter within that book or any other type of relationship that we noted here in the entry. So if we click around, I can show you another type of item. If I click over to planning and then choose dplan, you can see that now the item type is a web page. And there's a little bit of a different view here, different information. This one also has an abstract below. There's still information in the notes tab, the tags, and then this one actually does have an attachment. It's that web page in HTML format. And again, there's no related resources for this item. 
So as you're clicking around, uh, something to note is that whenever possible, we included resources that are freely available online with direct links to them, but that wasn't always possible. And in particular, you'll note that under additional resources, we do have a few items that are only available if you choose to purchase them. We weighed including those items, but ultimately decided that it's worth having them if they're high quality and so that you are aware that they're available to you if you decide to pursue them. And finally about Zotero, there are other features that will be available to you if you have an account and I won't go into those, but I do wanna note the search bar here if you have something specific you're looking for in this library and the documentation tab as well. If you have any questions about how Zotero works, you might find the answers here, although we are also happy to answer questions over email. And that's it. Please let us know if you have any questions or comments and thank you so much for watching. We would like to thank Connecting to Collections Care for having us, the REACH team for curating the Zotero Library, also American Industrial Hygienists Association's Museum and Cultural Heritage Working Group for providing subject matter expertise for the health and safety section. We would like to thank National Collections Program interns, Karina Gomez and Amy Zavesh for their efforts in gathering resources and managing the feedback and updates to the Zotero Library. And we would like to thank Sam Snell for leading this initiative and merging the AIC Emergency Committee and REACH Working Group efforts. Last but not least, thank you all for tuning in today. We hope these resources help you in your emergency management efforts, and please share out with your colleagues about these new tools. Hello, my name is Sonia. Hi everyone. Well, we hope you enjoyed that presentation. Um, now we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next presentation from Anne Marie. Um, she is the, oops, excuse me, I lost my notes. Give me one second. It's Anne Marie Willer, Director of Preservation Services, the Northeast Document Conservation Center. Today, she's gonna be telling us a little bit about the new version of D-Plan that's coming out. So Anne Marie, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Great, thank you, Robin. And I just made my Zoom tools disappear. So let me make those pop back up so I can share my screen. There we go. So hello, everyone. As Robin said, I'm Anne Marie Willer. I'm the Director of Preservation Services at NEDCC, the Northeast Document Conservation Center. And I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that I'm presenting to you today from the traditional land of the Massachusetts and Wampanoag, uh, located in the state of Massachusetts. And I invite you to join me in considering how we in the cultural heritage field might elevate indigenous uh, individuals and knowledge systems in our work and how we might better care for the land that we call home that has been stewarded um, and learn from those who've stewarded it for generations. Today, I'm speaking to you about D-Plan Arts Ready, an online emergency preparedness tool that launches literally within a matter of days. First, I'll introduce you to the free pocket response resource, and then I'll tell you about the new subscription-based D-Plan Arts Ready online tool. So D-Plan Arts Ready is an updated, intuitive, online emergency preparedness tool. It's designed for the arts and cultural heritage sectors, and it's usable and functional regardless of the organization's size, scope, or discipline. Now, some of you may be familiar with the original D-Plan, which was launched in 2006, 
And you can see its distinctly vintage look on this slide. So it was definitely due for an update with 21st century features. In 2017, Lyricis received a Mellon Foundation grant to merge NADCC's D plan with another emergency planning tool called Arts Ready. And we took the strengths of both tools and combined them into an even better tool that meets the needs of both the cultural heritage and performing arts communities. And as I mentioned, we are launching that tool in a matter of days. As part of our work on upgrading DPlan Arts Ready, we developed the Pocket Response resource. It's a one page front and back template that is designed to be printed and then folded up so that you can keep it in your pocket or in your wallet for quick reference in an emergency. The Pocket Response Resource, or the PRR as we call it, is not meant to replace a full emergency plan, but it can be a great place to start with the initial steps of disaster preparedness. The template might look a little familiar to some of you because it is based on the prep plan originally developed by the Council of State Archivists. Side A of the plan focuses on contacts. This is where you'll list everyone who may need to be informed or activated in an emergency. And if we look at the first column, which you may or may not be able to see depending on your screen, um, you'll see there's space there for internal institutional contacts, including folks like your director and public relations manager. These may not be the people who are directly involved with collections actions following a disaster, but they're part of the broader group that, of people who absolutely must be informed whenever there is a disaster. And then the next columns include contact information for your response team, then your building contacts, first responders, mutual aid partners, emergency recovery services, and other relevant contacts. Side B of the pocket response plan focuses on your action steps. Again, this isn't your full disaster plan, but it provides guidance on what to do in the first minutes or hours after a disaster occurs. You might choose to modify certain sections of the template to better fit your institution. For example, if you're located within a historic structure, then in addition to listing collection priorities in the, in the final column here on side B, you might also include information about the building itself. And that's fine. We want you to use the fields and the entries that are relevant for your organization and then edit or delete out the rest. One of the benefits of the PRR is that we have formatted it to fit on a regular size eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper so that you can fill it out and print it at home on, on your home printer and very easy to photocopy. No more looking for legal size paper. If you are part of an umbrella organization or consortium, you might choose to customize parts of the pocket response resource for your membership or for your region and then distribute it to your members for final customization. So for example, each facility in a town arts district might have the same town-based contacts listed with only a few sections needing uh, local edits for their specific organization. So that's a great way to work together. The pocket response resource is accompanied by the PRR guides and resources, which is a library, a limited library of basic emergency planning resources these are curated and annotated by NADCC staff. And you can see a couple of examples here uh, from the communication category um, here on the right side of the slide. And you can also see the categories themselves are listed um, on the left side of the sl slide. And some of the things, uh, I'm just thinking about the uh, presentation we just heard about the AIC wiki. And I just wanna point out there are a few categories here that are related to but separate from collections care. So this is where you'll find things about IT, communication plan, uh, continuity of operations, um, 
finances and things like that uh, with only one section devoted to uh, assets like collections. You can download the PRR template and you can access the PRR guides and resources at nedcc.org slash dplan. The complete dplan arts ready tool requires an annual subscription and subscriptions fund free technical support for dplan arts ready subscribers, as well as the future updates and enhancements to the software because we'd like to avoid ending up in a situation where we have that vintage look again. The good news is that the subscription cost is within reach for most organizations, only $59.40 per year, which if it strikes you as an odd number, that is $4.95 a month, so $4.95 times 12. You can see bulk purchases in the middle of this slide. This is one of, the, uh, one of the ways that groups and consortia can use DPlan Arts Ready for their members. For example, these groups might be a consortia um, for performing arts organizations in a region, could be a regional library council, a county level or state level office for cultural heritage, something like that. And so those groups can arrange to provide free or discounted subscriptions to DPlan Arts Ready for their members. Just contact us to discuss your options and we'll tell you how to, how to roll that out to your group. And there is special funding from the Mellon Foundation for free one-year subscriptions for arts organizations. I've blocked out the contact information on this slide because the form isn't live yet, but it is a simple application process. And once you're approved, you'll receive a discount code that will zero out the cost of your first year subscription. So any of you who are in arts organizations or performing arts organizations, please make note of this uh, special offer and um, spread the word to organizations who could benefit from it. After you've logged into DPlan Arts Ready, you will have access to five modules that support your institution's emergency preparedness planning and response. And these are risk assessment, action items, critical stuff, guides and resources, and reports. So let me give you a look at each of them. DPlan Arts Ready starts with a risk assessment module. This ensures that the preparedness actions that you take within the rest of the tool are purposeful and focused. The risk assessment has 90 questions covering nine critical areas of preparedness. And um, I've listed those nine critical areas here on the inset on this slide. As part of the risk assessment, you indicate a risk level and a readiness level for each question. And the risk assessment box on your dashboard keeps track of your progress through the 90 questions. You don't have to do it all in one sitting. You can um, log out and log back in to finish. This is what the risk assessment module looks like. The nine critical areas are on the left-hand side of the screen. The organization administrator or manager for your DPlan account enters your readiness level, the risk level, and can add notes. So if one of the risk assessment questions is marked not ready, as the readiness level and marked as serious as a risk level, then it goes on to your danger list. Uh, so that's a quick um, and convenient way to identify your top priority items. And that will help you um, focus in on your first steps for preparedness. The entire risk assessment with all the questions and answers can be viewed within the tool, can be printed, saved as PDF or downloaded as CSV. And it can be archived within the tool. Uh, and that will enable you to, for example, do your risk assessment, archive it, and then a year later, do it again. And then you'll, you'll still have your older uh, assessment there for comparison purposes. The second module is action items, and this provides a space where you can create and assign preparedness tasks and add deadlines. 
Action items can be added from three different places, from the dashboard, from the action items module, and directly from each risk assessment question, which is shown here on the left. Users can add an action item just as soon as they answer a risk assessment question and realize that there's something specific that needs to happen. The action items are organized into the same nine critical areas, and each action item can be marked as critical, high, medium, or low priority. So just another way to focus your efforts. Your personal list of action items will display on your dashboard. The full list of action items can be viewed, sorted, and exported with, from within the action items module. And then as things are worked on, it can be marked in progress or complete. So now let's look at critical stuff. When we were deciding what to call this module, we realized that critical stuff was really the best thing that captured what we meant. Your organization can upload files, documents, images, spreadsheets, links, notes, um, with information that you need for disaster response. And then you'll be able to access any of that that you've uploaded and uh, anytime later when you access the tool. So even if you're your server at your, at your institution is down, uh, your most critical stuff will be up in the cloud uh, and ready for access. Deep Plan Arts Ready is optimized for mobile access. So depending on the various apps you have on your phone, like a PDF viewer and that kind of thing, you will be able to open the PDFs and the documents that you've uploaded um, even from your phone. In addition to uploading files, organizations can enter information manually into a database. So here's an example of a place, that's the senior center, and a person, the electrician, that have been just entered manually into the database. The um, DPlan Arts Ready website lives on a dedicated AWS server, that's the Amazon Web Services. And it's compliant with Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1, level AA, and it is protected by HTTPS. The fourth module is Guides and Resources. NEDCC and South Arts have curated a library of resources, links, and tools, templates for disaster preparedness and response. This is a more robust library than the limited resources that are provided for free with the pocket response resource. And some of these resources are custom templates that we've made specifically for this project and they're not available elsewhere. The resources that we've um, uploaded will uh, assist you and are organized by those nine areas, uh, critical areas of preparedness. You can see those nine critical areas here on the left. That is the organizing structure here. And you can see two examples. The first one is a sample emergency succession plan that you can use as a template. And the second one is a website with information about COVID and cultural heritage collections. The fifth module is reports. Deep Plan Arts Ready offers 10 reports. All of them can be exported as PDF and as CSV, uh, the latter of which allows you to make some formatting changes and use the data in, in a way that, that works for you. On the left side of this slide, you can see the 10 reports that are available. There's a collections report, emergency response team contact list, uh, venue information, uh, master contact list, medical procedures, external emergency, internal emergency, suppliers. Those are just, I don't know if that's most of them, I think eight or so out of the 10 that I just read off. The procedures for a medical emergency are here on the slide. It includes some basic response information as boilerplate, and then it includes the first responder information that is specific to your organization. 
Several of the reports on the left are singular elements of your overall disaster plan, and you can print and export them so that you have a paper-based backup um, of your most important information that, that you have in your Deep Plan Arts Ready account. This also allows you to mix and match elements of your plan into a customized format that works for your organization. You might even choose to have plans of differing levels of detail based on a person's role in the organization. For example, you might have a complete plan that you give to your department heads, and then you might have a much simplified plan that has less personal information that is accessible to your volunteer staff. Information and a link to the DPLAN Arts Ready Online Emergency Preparedness and Planning Tool is available at this URL, which I will paste into the chat momentarily. It's nedcc.org slash dplan. So please watch for the announcements of the launch of the upgraded tool. You can sign up for NADCC's e-news list if you'd like to be notified directly upon launch. Follow us on social media as well. We will be telling everybody when the tool is live uh, because we've been uh, waiting, uh, waiting with bated breath for, for it to launch and with, and with great excitement. I want to thank the Connecting to Collections Care team for inviting me to present today. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions during the question and answer period. Thanks, Anne-Marie, that was great. I'm excited to see this because I know I've been using D-Plan since the olden days of the mid O's. So it's kind of fun to see kind of just how it's developing and, and what it looks like. So I, this, is, this is exciting for sure. Thank you, thank you. Well, feel free to uh, stop sharing your screen whenever you're ready. And I'm gonna invite our other panelists to hop on their videos when they have a minute. Um, I also wanted to invite our audience if they want to chime in in the Q&A box, if they have questions about these resources, they are more than welcome to put them in the chat box or um, in a little bit, I'm gonna ask a big general question, I think, which is, well, we'll go ahead and ask it now, why not? What other kind of tools do you guys use for emergency plans? Like, I know that there's a lot out there, obviously. We just saw two fabulous ones, but what else have you all used? Some people in the chat were already saying that they've used the, the prep plan and used those previous. So it was nice to see that people have already had those out there, but I'm curious to see what other folks have used as well. Um, and as we wait for that, Alina, do you wanna go look over in the Q&A box and see if we have any questions posted in there already? Yes. Um... We have one question here. Any consideration being made to turn the pocket response plan into an app? So I'm guessing that's for Anne-Marie. Um, no, the pocket response plan is created in the spirit of the, of the prep plan meant to be a simple physical analog reference tool. Um, and we're aware that, um, yeah, that was just, that was a decision that was made. I think early on, we did actually talk about, you know, seeing if we could turn that into something that could be um, on the phone. And we realized that folks could simply save the document into their documents folder on their phone and just pull it up. And there was actually no need to add this sort of layer of complication of, of making it into an app. But thank you for asking, who knows what might happen in the future? Um, I was wondering if Sonia and Kim could talk a little bit about Zotero. There was a bunch of chat when you guys showed that. Like, I have never seen that before. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can think of like a bazillion different applications for when it comes to that. So how did you guys identify that? And how did you find that? And how did you decide to use that as the basis of the AIC emergency portion? Well, um, I'll go first. And... Um kind of share what I have to say about that. So the uh, decision to use Zotero came um, from the REACH working group. Uh, they really considered how to best share the content uh, for free and also how to give more information about all the resources and capture the uh, 
kind of the provenance of where it's coming from. And that was the platform they settled on. Um, I had heard about it previously in regards to um, online bibliographies and also kind of the preliminary step to creating a libguide. So I think there is uh, many applications, uh, including just keeping personal research and personal bibliographies organized. Um, I think there's also a feature which uh, Kim, I think I'm gonna let you talk about that because I think you know more about it. Something about generating a printed bibliography. I'm gonna take myself off the air. Yeah, um, with respect to generating a printed bibliography, I actually haven't really played with that, but it's my understanding that that's something that you can do if you have an account. So I think our average user who shows up to the wiki page and clicks through, I'm not sure that that's something that you would be able to do without getting further into Zotero. Um, but that being said, it is a really useful tool, and I can add that I believe other AIC wiki groups or other other AIC um, groups have started using Zotero as well. And so that's kind of, I think, part of the impetus for this as well, that we're starting to see uh, a little bit of um, coming together on Zotero as a resource for collecting these kinds of links. Uh, for us, I know that we had content on this page before and it can get unruly when it's links and links and links and we're coming up with more links and it's just kind of dumped on a page so the zotero lets us organize that a bit better uh, i also would say that the tags uh, and some of that metadata are like game changing for what makes zotero so helpful is that you can sort you can search um, you can have this, you can have, you know, hundreds of links and still be able to get what you need from it. So, um, not to be a Zotero ad, but I know I've also started using it personally and I'm, I'm very happy with it. I don't think you're an ad by any means. I got excited when you guys were showing that. I was like, that's really neat. <laughs> it was like that kind of thing. And I'm not in that world all the time. So it was really nice to see the layout of it and stuff. So wonderful. Um, Someone said earlier too about the merge that Anne Marie you had talked about with DPlan and ArchReady. They said they just wanted to mention that the merge is a great thing. So many cultural heritage institutions are going hybrid, um, and that they had consulted with one that is performing arts center and a museum. So it's nice to see that that hybrid, you know, that that activity is well thought of. How did that come about? Was it just because you guys knew that was out there, or what was kind of the impetus of that merge? Yeah, the, the, the overarching grant that this is part of is uh, the Performing Arts Readiness Grant that is um, was awarded by Mellon Foundation to Lyricists. And so there's definitely, it's a performing arts focus and Arts Ready is a performing arts tool and was really strong with business continuity and that kind of thing. Whereas uh, DPlan was really collections focused and we saw both groups understood that performing arts organizations have assets like costumes or um, spaces and, and their own institutional archives that they weren't thinking of in a disaster. And so they would, that group would benefit from what was in DPlan and DPlan uh, with the archives, libraries and museums field would benefit from some of the strengths of the arts ready tool that was focused on continuity of operations and that kind of thing. And even I mean, when you think of it, most public libraries have some sort of public um, conference room or performance space. And as I think um, with the pandemic, everyone's kind of become aware of where the public is gathering. <laughs> and so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of overlap there. So thanks, Tara, for your, for your, for your comment on that, about that. Yeah, I know I have some uh, friends uh, who work who are work for libraries, but they're exhibition people who work for libraries. So you see that too, like this crossover happening more and more amongst the different things. 
Um, Elena, what are you seeing so far? I see a couple, I see resources being shared. I don't know if we want to go through those or if we want to go through more questions or what do you think we should focus on? Yeah, right? I just wanted to hit on this one question because I, I typed an answer in the Q&A box, um, but want to bring it up in case anybody has any other resources to share. Um, this person said, where can one find free online training, past webinars, et cetera, and examples of tabletop exercises on disaster response? Um, they're trying to build a good resource list so they can train staff and do refreshers. Um, and I responded with a link to a joint tabletop exercise that ARCS and AIC, FAIC did together last spring for May Day. Um, but I'm also going to put that in the chat. Um, but I know that FEMA, ready.gov, a lot of government organizations have um, like templates for different types of exercises and training, such as tabletop exercises. Um, but I'm curious if anybody else has anything to add. Do any of you as our panelists, do you guys have any examples of tabletops? Those are always really popular. And if our audience doesn't know, tabletops are basically when you run through a scenario, just sitting around a conference room and you basically play the game of what if, is what I think of. Not, not the fun Marvel series, what if, but more like the you know, sitting there and saying, you know, okay, if, if we had a pipe burst, we had this burst, how would you react to it? So they're, they're good ways of testing your plan too. That's how I think about it. Do you guys know of any sources or anywhere where you can see them? We, we have a few resources um, that I'll pop into the chat if I can find the links, but there's, there's a, there's one in particular that I have in mind that is that we've, we've mined and some of our clients have mined for, um, for tabletop exercises, you know, within their own institution. So. I was going to just say that um, this tabletop exercise video um, for last year's May Day, that is included in the Zotero library also under response with a little video icon. Someone in the chat says to uh, talk to your first responder organizations, they probably have tabletop exercise. That is a very good idea. And that also goes back to the whole make friends with your local police department, police officers, fire department, all those fun things, because they'll have all sorts of fun resources that you can uh, dip into as time goes on. Seeing lots of stuff being thrown out there, which is great. People talking about the Getty book, um, all sorts of fun ones. So yeah, this is an excellent. Thanks everyone. One thing I wanted to go back to too was um, you guys talking about the the AIC emergency committee that that project was the fact of how it was micro volunteerism, which I think was like a great term for what happened with this. And I mean, when you guys went out to gather this group, I know it was the Realm group, but how how did you guys reach out to all these people? Did you have personal contacts there? Did you just know they were interested? Kind of how did you gather your volunteer group together to create this micro volunteerism project or concept? Well, full disclosure, uh, Kim and I really didn't have anything to do with reaching out to these people. Uh, it The credit really goes to, um, kind of the founding members of REACH and uh, Sam Snell, who works for the um, National Collections Program. She uh, was a part of REACH and she also happened to be on the AIC Emergency Committee. So uh, right from the start, I think she it was kind of her brainchild to merge these two entities together because the working group was kind of a temporary you know, you work on something, you accomplish it, the goal is reached, you're done. Um, and then the AIC wiki and kind of the resulting resource and the platform is more like, here's how, you know, people can access it. So Kim and I were involved in a lot of the vetting and the review of the resources, but we weren't around for, um, uh, for the kind of recruitment of the original original core group. I think um, it started with just the Smithsonian folks uh, talking to each other. And it may, you know, it sounds like, oh, just the Smithsonian folks, but there's so many museums and organizations underneath um, that umbrella. There was already a lot of people. 
And then I think through collaborations and connections, other people were contacted and asked to join and it became like a real big team. Excellent, thank you. Um, it looks like there's more sources being shared. You guys are doing great. We will capture all these and make sure to put these on the website. This is always why I love this audience is because once you start asking for resources, you kind of get this like huge plethora of things that you're just be like, oh, I didn't even know about that. And so in fact, someone put in a resource for Zotero. So thank you for doing that. Because like I said, I think there's some untapped possibilities with that for sure. Um, did you have any other resources you wanted to share with the group, Elena, or anyone else on the panel that you guys can think of? I did find my salvage wheel, which I was very proud of. That usually hangs up behind me. So that one's sitting there. And if you enter the survey, you could maybe win one. <laughs> so that's always- Yeah, enter the yeah. survey, you could win one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put that in for ruin, please. Let's see what else is happening. Okay. One question I did have about actually the D plan, Anne Marie, was, um, and this just occurred to me while I was watching you, is that the interface looks really nice, but how long, approximately, how long do you think it takes for someone to complete all the information, like for a sit down? Do you think they should tackle it in one shot? Do you think it's multi session? What is your best way, do you think, to tackle it? And I know different people work different ways, but just generally speaking. My experience with uh, disaster planning would be that it would not be a one sitting situation because we rarely find that one person actually knows all the answers. So that in and of itself. Plus, there are some decision points. Um, you can upload um, an existing staff list for your critical stuff, or you might have reason to manually enter a select number of people into the database. So you have to decide like, am I gonna type these people in or am I gonna upload it as a Word document? Um, and um, that sort of thing. So I think, I think it's better to you know, do it in a couple of sittings. I would also say, at least in my experience, and y'all chime in as well, that it's always good to have, obviously you have a point person who's sitting there like probably doing the typing, but when you get to the questions and all that, like the answers, sometimes it's good to have a team of people working with you because that's a lot to ask. Yeah. <laughs> so you have the ability to, to skip over questions and answer them later. And you also have the ability to skip over questions that don't apply to you. So if it's something, I don't know, about some sort of weather situation that just never happens in your part of the world or whatever you can skip over that question and the tool's not going to yell at you for skipping it right um, because if it doesn't apply it doesn't apply excellent going back to the list of resources now i do want to shout out the uh steal this handbook a template for creating emergency preparedness plans by alan lord that is this old standby that i always like to use i think i saw the copy floating around in my library um i'm going to ask each of our panelists if you guys don't mind and you can be unbiased on this. What is your favorite resource to use when it comes to disaster planning? You can say yours if you want to, but is there one besides yours <laughs> that you would like to highlight as maybe your favorite resource when it comes to developing emergency plans or disaster planning? Elena, can I put you on the spotlight first? What's your favorite resource? I'm definitely going to say the app, but it's not currently operational. So um, once the app is back, it's going to again be the app, um, the ERS app. So soon to be. <laughs> and what about you? What's your favorite resource to use when it comes to disaster planning? Always really enjoyed the wheel, the disaster wheel. I know it's extremely old school, but there's just something about the way that it's formatted and you can move it around. I don't know if it like taps into like your child brain when you're moving toys around or something, um, but it, it has it's, it has an amazing am, amount of information to squeeze into a tiny space, and it's all really good. Um, but I'm also really, really looking forward to seeing it in app form because I think that is more practical than carrying the wheel around. Thank you, Kim. Do you have any thoughts as to what your favorite resource is? I do also really like the wheel, um, but I think I, I really like the FEMA resources that I've used. Um, there, it's nice knowing the perspective of 
uh, like emergency responders in general rather than museum folks only. Uh, I feel like it gives some context to to uh, what we're doing that's helpful. Excellent. Anne Marie, what about you? Um, I'll admit I have I have the older app on my phone. And um, I do find that really useful while it's, um, while it's, you know, been sort of being um, updated and, and sort of reconfigured. Uh, I, I do use the old salvage at a glance chart because knowing that's usually the, it's the finer details of like, remind me again if this can be frozen or not, or something like that. Those are the kinds of things that I like to double check in an emergency situation where I feel like maybe I'm not trusting my memory uh, just because everything is so stressful. So I, I really do refer, uh, count on those. But I will say that I love any, any of the prep style plans, including the PRR that we developed, but there's countless other COSA style prep, prep templates on the COSA website. Um, for different types of organizations, just because it's so customizable, and you can just really put exactly what you, everyone needs um, right on it. I, I just love that. Yeah, I really like that. I'll say just for a shout out, the pocket plan is always my favorite. I was always very jealous of the people who had the little Tyvek covers. There was like every once in a while and you walk around, people's like, people are like, I have a Tyvek cover. And I would always be like, I want a Tyvek cover. <laughs> like, where did you guys score those? Always very jealous of those. I also shout out the National Park Service Conservagram. Sometimes they'll just have fun information that if you dig around in, you'll see all sorts of fun um just random things if you really want to deep dive into certain they're good for reference later on um, also our colleagues up north the cci guides are always really great to look at we'll try to have links to all that online for sure um i also enjoy the wheel i always find it funny whenever so every once in a while they'll do interviews with uh with conservation labs and that kind of stuff and i always like to see if i can spot the wheel in the background because every once in a while you will see the wheel kind of floating around in the background of interviews and stuff which is always a good time so yeah, any sources like that, I think are really useful for everyone. Plus, and I always say this when it comes to emergency planning, if you know of a good plan, our group is so wonderful because it's always, <laughs> it's kind of nice to, you can steal nicely. You can pull the elements from plans that you like or you've experienced and you do. And those are really usually very good uh, starting places for your own plan if you'd like to as well. And I always encourage that. It does look like we had a question pop into the Q&A. Elena, would you like to read that to our audience? Yes. Um, regarding D plan, I may have missed this and apologize if I did, but is D plan now set up so that when you have multiple buildings in your museum organization, all information for all buildings can be incorporated into one plan? D plan uh, Arts Ready has the ability to accommodate more than one facility on your account. Um, people have approached this multi facility multi-building um, planning differently. And so the, so I'm just saying it may or may not be exactly what you were imagining or what you were expecting, but it's a matter of um, using the way that the tool is currently configured to accommodate the multiple buildings. So if you have, if anyone has any questions about how to manifest that, because it's a little different than the old D plan, we're happy to, to walk you through it. And then once it clicks, you'll be like, oh, okay, this is how I get in my multiple buildings. Um, so yeah, I look forward to, to, to seeing how organizations that have more than one facility can, can use this. I think, I, think, I think you'll find it works better than the older D plan, so. I do think that when you're dealing with multiple buildings, that is always a, an interesting conundrum, you know what I mean, of, of looking at your facility and kind of trying to figure out how to handle that in general. Um, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping things up, I think, just generically. Um, would anyone like to do, we're going to go ahead and share a bunch of links in the chat right now. So we're going to go ahead and Elena's going to share the survey again, that'll get you in line to maybe get one of those fabulous circles that we're all talking about, the wheels. Um, I'm going to, in a minute, share a link to 
the survey for this webinar, because CDC CARE, we always have to do a survey for our webinar, and also a link to the registration page, which includes resources, copies of these presentations, which include the QR code to get to the AIC emergency, the wiki that or the, the program that they've set up. Um, but while I'm doing that, I would ask anyone to go ahead and pass along your final thoughts, anything you'd like to pass along to our audience as we kind of wrap up this program today. So does anyone have anything final to add or say to anyone? I, I, I do. Um, in the very beginning of the of this webinar, uh, there was the uh, introduction to May Day, and I had read it before, but I kind of missed the uh, I missed a detail that I think is really crucial. Um, it can be really, I think, overwhelming to become aware of all of these resources and all this information, all of these improvements that can be made. Um, and the truth is that our time and our budgets are very limited. And um, in the May Day description, it said, we're encouraging people to do just one thing. And that is one is bigger than zero. So, if you can do one thing, even just watching this webinar and then, you know, knowing that these resources are there for you for later, that's your, that could be your one thing. So I, yeah, no discouragement. That's very true. Just by watching this webinar, you can enter to win for the survey. You did your one thing. So that is a super good point. Kim, do you have any final thoughts for our audience when it comes to disaster planning or anything else? I do. Yeah, I just want to reiterate that um, our efforts through the emergency committee and the wiki and ultimately the Zotero are really collaborative. So when I see all of these great resources coming in in the chat, I'm very excited. Uh, we will definitely be looking through these to see if there's anything that we should be adding to the Zotero. But please, if you are um, reading the Zotero or the Wiki yourself and you have ideas for things that you're not seeing, please do reach out to us because we, we'd love to hear about it. And Marie, do you have anything you'd like to share? Well, Sonia said exactly what I what I was going to say that that just do one thing is really the focus it just um, can just, you know, you can pick the easiest thing. That's okay. It's one thing that brings your institution one step closer and makes you um, more better able to protect, protect both them, both people and, and property and collections when the time when the time comes. Yeah, I like that. And I mean, in a perfect world, if, because this is a daunting concept, like when you sit down, you're like, I'm going to write a plan for my facility or my institution. It is a bit like, where do I start? And I really think that if you have a combination of looking at the new D plan and then using all the resources that you guys talked about with the AIC, you could come up with a really good plan and not a, a decent amount of time. It's going to take work, but it's not going to be quite so daunting as sitting and looking at a blank sheet of paper and trying to figure out kind of where to start. So I think using those two resources especially are gonna be a great place to start to create that plan. Elena, do you have any final thoughts for our audience? I just second what everybody else said. Um, yeah, just one thing this month to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, it's it, it can be very overwhelming how much is out there and how advanced some institutions are, but it's a judgment-free zone. Just try to do one thing and you are on your way. Well, I'm going to go ahead and say a huge thanks to everyone. Thanks to all of our presenters today. You guys did great. I love seeing all these new resources. Um, thanks to uh, Learning Times, our technical producer. Thanks to uh, FAIC, as always. And this is an IMLS supported program. So we always thank you, thankful for them and the funding they're able to provide. And um, stay tuned because we have one more webinar for this month, May 31st, sustainability. So we're, we open the month and we close the month. So we're hoping to you know, get a lot of good information about disaster and emergency planning out there all for May Day. So thanks and we will see you at the end of the month and we hope everyone stays safe. And if you're coming to the conference, stop by and say hi because there'll be some of us floating around in LA. So we hope to see you there. So thanks and talk to you soon.